Facebook this morning as part of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission's 2021 Virtual Outdoor Expo. We will begin our latest session here. Let's talk muskies in approximately 30 seconds. All right, and good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to the 2021 Virtual Outdoor Expo presented this week by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. My name is Mike Parker, Communications Director for the agency. Happy Friday morning to you all. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to bring you uh, really our final session uh, that, that's based on content this week. Uh, that is uh, an original topic, which is Let's Talk Muskies. Uh, this afternoon at 1 o'clock, We'll have our wrap-up session where we'll sort of go over the week, talk about all of our sessions, and give you the opportunity to ask any lingering questions or things that we might not have gotten to throughout the week. But for now, it's all about uh, Pennsylvania's apex predator, uh, the muscalunge. And joining us to talk about this incredible species is Fish and Boat Commission biologist Brian Ensign, as well as Jared Sayers, manager of the PFBC's Linesville State Fish Hatchery. So guys, I want to say thanks for being here and good morning. Hey, thanks for having us, Mike. You got it. You got it. So two of the agency experts on the topic of muskies. A reminder to anyone who's tuning in right now on Facebook Live as we stream here this morning, your questions and your comments are welcome. That's exactly why we're here. We're going to try to get to as many of the relevant questions that we can to talk with our experts over the next 40 minutes to an hour or so. But remember, if it's just a basic question about fishing and boating unrelated to uh, muskies, you can find answers to many frequently asked questions on our website, fishandboat.com. All right, so to kick things off, we're just gonna spend a minute or two with our guests here each, and I'm gonna ask you, we'll start with you, Jared. You wanna talk about your uh, experience and what led you to the hatchery system with the Fish and Boat Commission? Sure. Um, you know, as it seems like a popular answer, um, I grew up hunting and fishing, and that's what I truly had a passion for. Um, I never really thought I, would have an opportunity to make that into a career, um, but I decided to give it a shot. So I went to college. I got a bachelor's degree in biology and ecosystem conservation. Um, then I started looking for job opportunities. I applied to the Fish and Boat Commission. It took me about three years, but I did finally get hired as a seasonal fish culturist at the Union City Hatchery. I actually worked there with Brian Enzyme. Um, we started in the early days of muskie feed, feed conversion. So we've been in this program for a long time. Uh, eventually, I transferred down to the Lionsville Fish Hatchery as a fish culturist, worked my way up to the foreman position, and eventually became a manager. So I've been the manager of the Lionsville Hatchery for about seven years now, and I've been with the commission for 14 years. Thank you, Jared. Brian, same question to you. Why don't you tell us a little about your background as a fisheries biologist? Okay, sure. Hi, Mike. It's great to be here with all of our uh, anglers today. Uh, Jared and I are always excited to talk about muskies. So, as he mentioned, we've kind of uh, been together growing up, working through the system and, and working with these fish. So, it's actually a personal fish we, we enjoy working with. So, as a field biologist by nature, I'm, at, I'm, I'm, I'm already itching to get out in the field, but I uh, guess we'll have to wait a little bit until we get some good weather before we can get out. A um, bit, bit of background about myself. I'm a lifelong hunter and fisherman. Uh, really enjoy the outdoors, uh, similar to, to Jared. Uh, regarding my professional background, I spent time in the Pacific Northwest, um, uh, specifically in Oregon, where I attended Mount Hood Community College um, and got my associate's degree in fishery science. Um, and then uh, after that, I uh, moved to Pennsylvania and I attended and graduated Mansfield University with a BS in uh, fishery science. That was back in 2002. During my summers while attending, I was actually an FBA, and I worked out of our Lake Erie Research Unit for a couple of years while I was in school. Then shortly after I, I graduated from there, um, after those two, two seasonal position, uh, two summers as a seasonal, um, I got on with our Union City Hatchery, and that was uh, um, uh, shortly after that. And about five years at the Union City Hatchery, and then uh, it was at our Union City facility. Jared and I both worked together there. 
Um, after that, I was promoted to a fishery biologist in 2010. Um, I'm currently in charge of our fisheries management area two office. We have an office here in Tyanesta, uh, stationed right with our hatchery as well, too. Um, and so all in all, I've been with the agency for about 17 years in the past 11 um, has been here at this office. So. All right. Excellent. Both of you guys have uh, have the credentials to back it up and we'll talk some muskies here in just a couple of minutes. As you know, it's a topic that is uh, it's, it's hot with the anglers. I would say that it's certainly that muskies are nothing new, but we do count it among our emerging fisheries because it seems as not only the program has evolved and is becoming more popular, but the activity, people who are out there spreading the word about muskies, getting excited about it, musky clubs are becoming more prevalent across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. A couple of years ago, we did a video. Um, we, uh, it's, it's, it's still quite up to date and we're going to take a, a couple of minutes to take a look at that. I want to say thanks to our producer this morning, Adam Spangler, who's keeping things going in the background as Adam cues up this video, about Pennsylvania's musky program. Jared, you had a part in producing this. You want to give us a quick preview as Adam pulls this up to tell us what we're about to look at for the next seven minutes or so. Sure. Yeah. You know, the, there's a lot that goes into the musky program, you know, and, um, We'll get into that more as we talk, but this video is going to show you a little bit about how we how we bring the muskies, the musky brood. You know, we have to catch large fish to be able to take the eggs from them. We raise them in the hatch house. We have outside raceways where we raise these fish, which will be shown in the video. Um, it's a it's a pretty good video that shows just a quick snapshot of how what the whole program is, and we'll be getting into some more of the details um, as we go through some of these questions. All right. And it looks like we're bringing that up right now. We're going to test it, make sure we hit, we've got audio, and then we're going to sit back and just and just watch this for a few minutes. Be patient here if we have to sometimes with technology. Not a big deal. We've dealt with this all week, and we've gotten to the point where um, playing the videos and showing the, the pictures has gotten a little bit easier for us, but every once in a while we have a little bit of a, uh, a, a waiting period as we found out. Give it another quick try. This was filmed at the Lionsville State Fish Lodge. The muscalunch or muskie, is Pennsylvania's largest game fish. Go get them, anglers. Long, strong, toothy, and fast, adult muskies represent the top of the food chain in our warm water fisheries. A success story still in the making, this noble giant can now be found in waters across the Commonwealth, from the Allegheny, Susquehanna, and Delaware rivers, to Presque Isle Bay, Pima Tuning Reservoir, Ravenstown, and Nakamikton Lakes, and many others making it more likely than ever before that anglers who seek this fish of 10,000 casts will find one of trophy size. The muscalunge in Pennsylvania is obviously an apex predator. These fish get up, um, the anglers are searching for fish. They're in that 50 inch class. And you know, they get up to 52 to 54 inches in some water bodies. Um, obviously there's nothing out there that's gonna prey on a fish of that size. Despite the muskies growing abundance, this apex predator is equally delicate when it comes to sustainability and survival. With minimal natural reproduction in lakes, we estimate that most angler muskie encounters can be attributed to stocking and management efforts by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. So this here is our, what we call our muskie unit. The stocking program begins in northwestern Pennsylvania at the Linesville State Fish Hatchery in Crawford County. So if you've ever caught a muskie in Pennsylvania, there's a very good chance it got its start here at the Linesville State Fish Hatchery. In recent years, the commission has placed new emphasis on muskies and changed its approach to stocking. Results from our coded wire tagging study revealed that stocking fewer but larger fingerlings in the late spring through early summer results in the greatest survival rates. As a result, all musky fingerlings are now stocked as one-year-olds, measuring an average of 12 to 14 inches in size. Now that we're getting up to the 12 and 14 inch range, there's pretty much nothing in these water bodies besides a northern pike, a very large large largemouth bass or another muskie that are going to take these fish down. So the likelihood of being preyed upon drastically decreases once we enter this 12 to 14 inch size range. So that's what the that's what the yearling muskies look like in the winter before they're stocked. 
These fish were born last April of 2018, and they'll be stocked in June of 2019. About 11, 12 inches right now, and hopefully they'll be 12 to 14 inches this summer. At the hatchery, muskies are grown from eggs collected from broodstock found in the neighboring Pima Tuning Reservoir, as well as Edinburgh Lake, Woodcock Creek Lake, and Lake Canadota. Each spring, hatchery staff use trap nets to collect large breeding age fish, which are then transferred back to the Linesville hatchery. Adult muskies are handled with care throughout the controlled spawning process. First, subdued with anesthesia, then placed on a special table able to accommodate larger fish. Gentle pressure is applied to the abdomen to collect up to 60,000 eggs per female. A similar process occurs to collect reproductive material from males. Only purebred muskies are spawned at Linesville and represent the majority of Pennsylvania's stocked muskies, about 35,000 annually. In addition, several thousand hybrid tiger muskies are produced annually at the Union City Hatchery in Erie County, where muskies are spawned with northern pike. Within two weeks, the fertilized eggs will hatch, and fry begin feeding on a yolk sac that sustains them during the first 10 days of life. Once the yolk sac is absorbed, the fry begin to swim and search for food. Initially, they're fed a combination of brine shrimp and dry pellet feed until they're fully converted onto dry feed. As they grow, the muskies are periodically fed minnows to boost their immune systems and maximize growth. But the muskies will remain on dry food pellets until they reach stocking size. Yeah, you can tell they look very much similar to what they look at as adults at this stage. You can see the bars. Um, they're very they're very susceptible to being stressed out at this stage, which is very much different than when they're adults. As they get older, they're a very docile creature. When we have the adults in here taking eggs from them in the springtime, um, we can just reach in the tank and pet these fish, and they don't mind at all. Many muskies collected as broodstock have been fitted with a passive integrated transponder, or pit tag. The same microchip technology used on household pets can later be used to gather data on these fish if recaught. Through the use of CWT, pit tags, and other methods, Fish and Boat Commission research reveals that within only three to four years, muskies can reach lengths exceeding 30 inches, with some fish reaching 40 inches by age five. After five years, fish will continue to add mass over several more years, with some reaching over 20 years of age and perhaps making it to the 50 inch length class. Being the apex predator, they're also not very plentiful. You know, we're shooting, when our area biologists go out and survey these lakes, they're looking for a density of somewhere around one fish per acre. They have the history of being called the fish of 10,000 casts. Here in Pennsylvania, we're kind of managing things, hoping to provide a fishery for our anglers that they can go out and expect to have an experience with one of these fish. The Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission Musty Program is essential to ensure there are good numbers of this trophy sport fish. Guided by modern management plans, a specific focus is to create targeted muskie fishing opportunities across the state. While the pursuit of the muskie will forever require patience and persistence, a successful angler will spend time understanding the habitat, natural feeding patterns, and aggressive tendencies of this species. You know, the muskies coming out of the winter, they, have, they go into a very, uh, a very aggressive feeding pattern. So guys target these fish as soon as the ice comes off in the spring. Um, and guys have a lot of success as these fish try to fatten up from their winter kind of dormancy period. Um, and then, then throughout the summer months, uh, these fish are generally te keying on larger fish and uh, they're conserving their energy so that they can put that energy into growth. So during that time period, the anglers are targeting these fish with very fast presentations. They're doing long casts and reeling very fast, so they're trolling for these fish so they can get that instinctive bite. They, you know, they want that muskie to see that bait and only have a millisecond to think about it and they just strike out of instinct. While Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission regulations allow for the legal harvest of muskie, most anglers choose to catch and release these trophy-sized fish. To ensure the survival of the fish, safe handling of your catch is essential. The musky slime coat is very important and protects the fish from disease. Every attempt should be made not to wipe off the slime coat. It's important not to touch the red gill parts. Carefully hold the musky under the gill plate with your fingers wrapping around the lower jaw. A musky should always be handled horizontally, never vertically. When placing a muskie back into the water, there's no need to move the fish back and forth. Allow them to move water through their gills naturally. 
It is okay to hold the tail if it helps the fish stay upright during recovery. And as with any fish, the least amount of time spent out of the water, the better. For more information on the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission's Muskie program, including a guide to locating Pennsylvania's best muskie fishing waters and the availability of volunteer muskie permits to support our program, visit fishandboat.com. All right, so there we go. That was a pretty comprehensive, pretty comprehensive look at and, uh, the, the, the muskie from, from egg to uh, adult size, 40, 50 inch fish. Hard to believe that they're lurking out there and uh, in, in pretty good numbers uh, these days. So as a couple follow-ups to that video, Brian, we'll start with you. One of the takeaways there is that there's been some changes to muskie management over the years. Why don't you run down a couple of the changes that have that have occurred within the Fish and Boat Commission's musky management plan here recently. Sure, Mike. So uh, some of our anglers may be aware or may not be aware, and there was some reference to it in the video itself, but we do have a musky management plan. Um, there's been two revisions of the plan. First, it was uh, drafted in 2012, and then it was revised in 2017. And uh, kind of the objectives of that plan was to create some, create high destination, high quality destination waters uh, to really uh, provide those fishing and uh, experience, musky fishing experiences for our anglers. Um, some objectives that were also specifically written in that plan, specifically in 2012, were evaluating our stocking programs. Uh, well, we had one, mainly the fall fingerling plantings, and they, we've been historically doing those since the 1950s. Uh, but we had a pilot program as well, too, looking at wanting to increase the size of these muskies because we know they're going to lead to a, a better survival rate. Anything, any science that you look at, anything over 10 inches, uh, the the, the uh, opportunity for them to survive uh, increases exponentially. So I think that's always a target that our, our, our hatchery systems and fisheries management are really pushing towards. So uh, we had an opportunity to evaluate some of those studies. And uh, what we found out of that was the these, this yearling program that we had in a couple of these lakes was working really well, almost a three to one ratio. So. Uh, that's really what was the driving factor of why we made some changes to our stocking program. And there are, they were uh, provided in our 2017 management plan, uh, stocking these 12 to 14 inch, stocking them in the spring, uh, things like that. So, Jared, let's move on to some of the frequently asked questions that we have here regarding muskies and the program here with the Fish and Boat Commission. As we saw there at Linesville, uh, you're running quite a program, including many of the changes, incorporating those that Brian's talking about. Why don't you just talk about exactly how difficult it is to raise muskies as a species and uh, why that is and, and what the process is that you go through? Yeah, sure. You know, uh, generally we consider the muskie to be the most difficult fish that we raise. It's a, it's a species that has a lot of unique challenges. You know, right off the bat, you know, collecting brood and collecting the amount of eggs that we need to get to raise this fish is more difficult because there isn't a ton of these fish out there, although we're working on that. Um, you know, we collect about 7,000 adult walleyes every year to get our eggs, you know, we can, but we only um, are able to get the amount of musky eggs we need. We have to get about 200 fish. So um, these fish don't carry a lot of eggs, you know, even though they're a giant fish, you know, nature gives them the apex predators, uh, every disadvantage that they can, so they're not overpopulating, you know, you only want a few apex predators in your lake. So um, they have relatively few eggs, they have relatively few, uh, the males have a very tiny bit of melt, you know, so you think about in nature, the reproductive success is very, very low. So we have to fine tune our skills and our, our techniques to be able to get the most out of every fish that we can. Um, you know, then, once we do get the eggs collected and we start hatching these fish, these, these fish aren't like other species that hatch and readily take the food. You know, almost every other species will do that. The muskies are an apex predator. They don't want to be fed. They want to hunt. So we have to go through a 45 day conversion process, we call it, where we actually teach these fish how to eat the dry food that we feed them. We use a combination of the brine shrimp. And once they get feeding on the brine shrimp really heavily, we'll uh, introduce pinches of the dry food until they eventually recognize that as, a, that as a food source. But it's a very long and tedious process to be able to make that happen. Then once we get that done, you know, you know, just raising these fish up to size through the rest of the 
their life here at the hatchery is, is still difficult because these fish are they're prone to stress and they're prone to cannibalism if you don't keep the conditions just perfect. So we have to keep the, we spend a lot of hours keeping the tanks very clean. Uh, we spend a lot of hours separating these fish and um, making sure the densities, the, the amount of fish in each tank don't get too high or they'll start eating each other. Um, and we also have sp focus on making sure that all the fish are fed properly um, because they tend, if they have a nice full belly, they won't eat their, their brothers and sisters in the tank with them. But um, all of those things combined, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of man hours and uh, we really enjoy doing it. You know, part of the part of the fun about it is the challenge. Brian, Jared talked about this a little bit in the video, but I mean, it's uh, if an angler catches a muskie in Pennsylvania, there's a really good chance that that muskie actually started its its life at the Linesville State Fish Hatchery. That would especially be true in lake settings where there is little to no natural reproduction. So question for you is why don't we have more naturally producing musky waters in Pennsylvania, especially in lakes? Sure, Mike. Um, well, we, we know that uh, just through historical sampling that um, we uh, um, see just through doing our early spring surveys and some summer surveys and some fall surveys that we we really haven't documented much for natural reproduction. If we would have had natural reproduction in these waters, we would have documented well before our, actually before our talk today. But you know, we know that muskies in lakes go through the motions, uh, so to speak, and the, when the environmental conditions uh, warrant that, um, usually in the spring. Um, and uh, you know, there's several reasons why we don't see much natural reproduction, even though uh, we will have some habitat in there, but. Um, usually it's the lack of habitat or if there's some habitat in there, it's not quality habitat, uh, number one. So that would be like the spawning part of this. But also we have other factors happening in the lake as well, too. That would consist of predator densities and how many game species are in there. You know, these, these fish develop in, the, in, you know, in these lakes as eggs and then as fry and then as fingerlings. So there's a lot of uh, predators out there that can actually feed upon them and reduce the number that actually make it to a certain size. Um, so that, you know, there's, there's, there's more high mortality associated with that. Uh, second thing is sedimentation is a big thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of organic matter in the lake and, and then um, these muskies may spawn in a habitat where, you know, maybe it's not the exactly where they want to spawn, but they, they spawn and then it's over silty bottoms and, uh, you know, vegetation. And then um, as the lake is stirred up, as there's already natural organic matter in the lake and settling and you know, being stirred up, those, those eggs have a tendency to get suffocated and therefore the survival out of that is low. So there's kind of a gauntlet that these, you know, these fish have to go through. Uh, to make it to a size where they they won't, you know, they get to a fingerling size, and then we have some other predators that could feed on them as well too. So, you know, there, there's a lot of challenges for them to get from an egg so, from an egg all the way up to, you know, where they're not going to be preyed upon and be, contribute to, uh, you know, the population. Um, so we've documented over the years that, you know, our musky populations are sustained exclusively through stocking. Um, the other thing I'll mention too is, um, you know. I, our best areas of where we'd have natural reproduction would be in our flowing water systems. We we have documented some of those, but there's more diverse habitat features in there. So those would be some things that uh, you know that are, are challenges for a muskie, and that's they're solely dependent upon our stocking efforts in the lakes specifically to you know create those high quality fishing opportunities for our anglers that they would expect. All right, we're going to just mix in a couple of questions uh, as they relate to the topic here that we're getting from Facebook. Matt wants to know, and Brian, maybe this plays off of what you were just talking about. You tell me. The program seems to be doing great, he says. If success continues, will lakes that have stopped being stocked, that were stocked in the past, come back up for consideration for some musky stockings in the future? Sure. So, great question. Um, you know, when we devised the musky management plan, um, we are... Our, our, Basically, historically, we stocked every single, a lot of waters in PA, you know, to give that opportunity for an angler to catch a fish of a lifetime. Um, while that was a great thing at that time, what we've learned out of that is a lot, well, a lot of those populations never really materialized into a targeted fish, a destination fishery, you know, that produced much of a fishery at all. 
So when we devised the, must, the first um, initial plan in 2012, part of that was looking at it and seeing which ones are making it, which ones aren't making it. So um, we did some sampling during that time and we built a, a, a basically a minimum catch rate in there for our lakes. And if they weren't making it after a couple of years of surveys, we basically took them off the list. And the, basically what that did was that narrowed down the waters that are working really well. And we wanted to maintain those populations in those lakes. We already knew that they were destination fisheries as well too. So right now we're, you know, with that revision in the 2017 plan of stocking yearling muskies, um, that's something we're gonna be evaluating down the road here. We wanna stick with our plan requirements for now and evaluate that and determine which lakes are doing well. And then that's something that might be open for discussion down the road. Um, I know with several questions guys, have asked about that. That's something we'll, 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 we'll consider as we work through our management plan and through our data analysis. Jared, the next question is for you here about how much does it cost to raise a muskie from egg to that 12 to 14 inch uh, juvenile that's ready to be yearling, I should say, that's ready to be stocked. Okay, that's a that's kind of a, complicated question because it depends on how you look at it. You know, when in the Fish and Boat Commission, we look at costs in two different ways. We look at costs of programs, which is, you know, everything that goes into that, that fish species, including man hours and all the direct costs that, to the fish. Um, or you can just look at the direct cost. How much does it cost um, as far as things like feed or heating water? What are the direct costs for that fish? So as far as direct costs, the muskies really are not that that expensive. Um, we're able to raise, you know, 34,000 muskies last year up to that size range. And we only spent about $17,000 on dry food. So we're getting a lot of bang for our buck as far as feeding the fish. Um, the cost of the program is higher because the muskies, as I described, are a challenging species to raise. So they take a lot of man hours. Uh, we spend a lot of, uh, you know, time on the details of raising each phase of the muskie uh, process. Now, the interesting thing is when we made the change um, from the fall fingerlings to the spring yearlings, uh, we were able to um, keep the amount of direct costs, you know, the amount of money we're spending on money is the same by, um, by reducing the number of muskies that we're going to stock per year. Instead of stocking, you know, 80,000 small fish per year in the fall, we we're able to stock around 34,000 yearlings the next uh, the next early summer, um, and because of the reduced number, we're spending about the same amount of direct costs for those fish, which was one of our goals at the beginning. Um, however, we also consolidated the muskie program to just the Lionsville State Fish Hatchery. In the past, we had uh, four different hatcheries that were, you know, hatching eggs and going through that 45-day conversion process, and that was spreading the man hours out over, you know, four times more employees. So the man hours cost was exponentially higher. Um, so once we were able to consolidate that to Linesville, um, a lot of those man hours went away. So, you know, in the past, we used to look at the program and it was around a, a million dollar overall program cost. And now we've cut that down to it's almost somewhere around a $300,000 pro program now, which it makes us feel a lot better. Um, and when you look at some of the muskie clubs and what they're paying for these same size muskies on the open market, you know, we're raising about $800,000 worth of muskie yearlings every year. So we're getting some good bang for our buck. Follow up for you here, Jared. And we've talked about uh, the different sizes of muskies that you're growing from the fry to the, uh, the fingerling now to the yearling size. Here's a question. I mean, we talk about other species in terms of trophy size, like at some of our trout hatcheries, for instance, we have the stock size fish, which is about 11 inches long. And then we have some of the trophy size fish, which are up to 20 inches long. That here, here's a question from, uh, you know, from Walter. He wants to know, does the hatchery system have the proper infrastructure to grow out to even larger sizes, like larger fish or larger tanks? Is that even... Is that even reasonable? What if we put some in there that were 30 inches already? Is it even, is it possible to even grow them to that size in a hatchery? <laughs> well, currently probably not. It's something we could look at if there was a, if we thought there was a biological need for that. You know, when we think about stocking programs, no matter what species it's for, um, 
what we think about is raising that fish to the point where it's it's past where that species would normally get the major predation in in the wild. So, you know, in in bluegills or largemouth bass or something like that, you can imagine the most of them are getting eaten as fry, you know, and they don't they don't survive really, really well until they get until they get up to that three or four inch range. You know, muskies, obviously there isn't a lot of them out there in the wild, um, but they're going to get preyed upon until they get outside of the size range where the uh, largemouth bass can feed on them. So, you know, getting them past that 10 inch range and into that 12 to 14 inch range gets them out of out of the period where they normally get preyed upon in the wild. So, in theory, stocking a fish at 14 inches or stocking a fish at 30 inches, we're hoping that, you know, they're going to have about the same survival rate. You know, we're trying to get these fish to the size where um, they're going to live, or at least a high percentage of them, of them are going to live. So, I don't think there would be a need to raise fish of that size, but it's something, you know, that uh, would be interesting to think about. Brian, another question that came in from Facebook for you regarding how we determine uh, sort of the, the minimum size and creel limits in muskie. And the question relates to having success in some cases with natural reproduction. You put any thought into how we protect the larger fish that are responsible for the natural reproduction. And I assume that they're probably talking about in, in some of our rivers, if you didn't touch on that yet. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I mentioned earlier in my talk, in case some people are just joining us now, but I did mention that, you know, in lakes, we don't have much for natural reproduction. Uh, obviously, the best chance of that is gonna be in our flowing water systems. Uh, and we, we have documented that. Um, North Branch of Susquehanna is one of those that has natural reproduction and it's being managed uh, uh, appropriately that way. Uh, we've documented in some other waters as well too, but not at the level where um, stocking is definitely needed to maintain a high quality fishery. Um, as far as uh, minimum size limits in that, um, I think it's important to point out that muskies are already a, considered under the most people who fish for them as a catch and release uh, fishery. So um, when we have that, um, harvest really isn't a major issue removing bigger fish out of the population. Um, and as well as, um, you know, in these natural reproducing waters, um, we, we do have in lakes, we, we do have a broodstock lake program that protects some of these fish during the spawning time. Um, just that was, that's more for a hatchery utilage thing for, um, you know, for the, uh, we use a certain chemical that we put in you know, to use the fish to anesthetize them and then they're put back in the lake where they're from. So um, keep in mind with the minimum size limit um, on this is that because they are a catch and release, uh, primarily a catch and release species that, uh, you know, very early in the beginning when we were established, we used to have a, you know, a, a 30, 32 inch size limit on them. We raised that to 40 inches because that was a request of our anglers that they, Felt like maybe if, if if there is some harvest, we'd they'd like to see those fish get to a bigger size, and and so uh, we 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 honored that. We did that. We looked at our data and said, hey, that's we we support that decision. That's they wanted 36 inches. We actually moved it up to 40 inches, and we decreased the creel rate, uh, creel limit on those fish from two to one fish per day. So, um, you know, we we understood the you know kind of the desires of our our, our musky uh, folks out there and protecting that and wanting to get those larger size fish. So. Um, you know, and keep in mind, it's a stock fishery as well, too. So, you know, we're protecting it that way and, and keeping those populations, you know, in case we do have some issues with, uh, you know, anything happening with those lakes with those fish. We're getting a lot of questions for you guys. So uh, this is this is great. So we'll just keep them rolling if you don't mind. Uh, here's a here's an easy one. And, and as you notice, we're taking a look at we're keeping these photos and some of the videos up that you're seeing here. So it's a good time to answer the question, maybe as you're you're watching the video that we see on the screen. Simple question, but Jared, you want to handle this one? Um, John wants to know what's the difference between a tiger muskie and a traditional muskie. You want to explain that process a little bit? Sure. So um, a tiger muskie is a cross. Be it's a hybrid species. It's a cross between a northern pike and a muskie. Um, you can do the cross either way. Uh, we make the we do some of this spawning up at our Union City hatchery, 
you can use a male northern pike and a female muskie, or you can use a female northern pike and a male muskie. Um, generally, these uh, the, the tiger muskies are thought to be a little bit more of an aggressive fish. Um, they, they don't quite get as big as a purebred, purebred muskie, but they do get bigger than a northern pike. So they have some of the you know best qualities of each. Um, one thing about the tiger muskies is they tend to be more of a cool water uh, fish like the northern pike would be. So they work better in large impoundments and or river systems where there's some cooler water or deeper water. Uh, they wouldn't, they do not work as well in a shallow lake, um, even relatively shallow lake. Like the purebred muskies do really, really well in time tuning or, you know, water bodies that are 30 feet and less and kind of um, vegetated and uh, lots of phytoplankton in the water where the tiger muskies tend to do better in like Army Corps of Engineer lakes that uh, have a little bit clearer water, less organic water, uh, and have, they have access to cooler water. Um, it's just two different varieties of the species and we like to be able to offer both options to the anglers of Pennsylvania. Brian, if you would uh, take a look at some, this is a video right now of a finger, or a yearling muskie stocking, purebred muskie stocking at a, uh, I think this is Marsh Creek State Park in Chester County last season, 2020, I believe. Okay. Uh, as we take a look at this video, we're also going to get into, there, there'll be some other shots of, of muskies there. Different color phases that we see some of these muskies, obviously, if you could explain when, once we see it, the maybe the color variation or between a tiger muskie and a purebred. And then just a question, something that I've noticed, I mean, some of these fish are tend to be green. Some of them are almost, uh, ha have a very white color phase to them. Is that something that's natural for the species? And as we take a look at this video, feel free to explain it as you see a particular fish. Sure. So, uh, we, we kind of see, we, we typically see three phases of our muskies. I'll say kind of a, you know, color pattern or barred or spotted or things like that. So there's, there's basically three phases. So we have a clear phase and that's, Typically, you know, you see this more prominent in, I would say, our adult fish. When they get to about 30 inches in size, you'll, you'll start seeing some variations. Um, but in the purebreds, you're going to be more of the clear face. You don't see a lot of the spotting on them. They actually look like they're kind of orangish or, um, you know, kind of clear. There are less spots in them. And then there's like a spotter pattern, spotted pattern to them. And not to be confused with like the spotted muskie or anything like that. That's not what we're talking about. We're just various phases of this, the purebred uh, muskies, you'll, they'll, they'll be completely spotted through them all the way through the purple uh, and through the cheek and all that. And then we'll also see that what we call this barred phase. And Ryan, barred... real quick, just, just for context, since the video changed over, so you can tell these are actually tiger muskies. And this is the Swatera Creek, okay. a, tribu a tributary of the Susquehanna in Dauphin County. Okay. And so we often see, uh, in the, we'll see this barred phase, and they'll actually similar, look very similar to tiger muskie. Um, and uh, so there'll be the, the stripes going down the side of the fish and all the way through, it'll be really uh, prominent, this modeling part of the, uh, of the fish. And, you know, we'll get uh, comments from anglers saying, I'm not sure if this is actually a tiger or a purebred. Sometimes they look very similar, but there are some characteristics about that. But yes, you'll have fish that look more greenish, more look like bronzish. Uh, to them, there's a lot of variations in color patterns to these fish. Jared, back to the hatchery system and about switching some of the things that you had to do infrastructure wise from going from the, um, the fall fingerlings to the spring yearlings. What are some of the things that you had to adjust there at the hatchery to make that happen? Yeah. Um... Some of the things kind of caught us off guard a little bit, to be honest, you know, the early stages of the process are still obviously very similar. Uh, we collect about the same amount of eggs. Um, because we want to, once we reduce the number and we're stocking such large fish that we want to make sure that we don't come up short. We want to make sure that we have plenty of these fish to fill all of the requests that the biologists are asking of us. So we start off with about the same amount of fish. Um, now, our usual process was that we'd raise these fish in our hatch house until they got up to about four or five inches. And then, you know, in mid June, we'd take them out to the outside raceways where they would have more room to grow. And uh, we really got a, a big jump in growth once we started taking these fish out to the outside raceways. 
Now, the problem was when we started raising yearling muskies, you know, we had, we didn't realize how much weight there was going to be of these things. So back when we were stocking fall fingerlings, we were stocking 2,000, 4,000 pounds of muskies every year. Now we're stocking almost 12,000 pounds of muskies a year. And it takes a lot of stocking truck trips to get those things out of here. Um, we've had to bring in several other hatcheries and it's taken a lot of cooperation to be able to stock these fish in a timely manner. Um, and different than the trout hatcheries have to deal with because our waters, you know, usually put right around 70 degrees at that time. It doesn't hold as much oxygen. So we can't, we can't load our tanks up like they would on a trout stocking stream. So it takes a lot of trucks to get these fish out of here. And the timing of getting the fish that are in the hatch house at four or five inches out to the raceway so we can maximize growth and getting um, the yearling fish that have already been out in the raceways up to that 12 to 14 inch size range and then stocked so that we can clean the raceways, disinfect the raceways and get the fish out there. Um, that's really been the biggest adjustment for us is um, everything has to fall into place and we have to make sure that we're on our game and we're getting these fish up to size as fast as we can and that uh, we're spreading the fish out in the hatch house as much as we can so that we're not losing growth and just getting the two the two year classes of fish um, to fit together perfectly has been a challenge, but it's something we've adjusted to and it's working pretty good. Brian, two questions here for you. Uh, this one from Facebook, someone who wants to know, and you've again t touched on this, but I want to ask the question uh, since it's a specific question. If the conditions were right, would stocked muskie, would a muskie that was raised at our hatchery be able to reproduce in the wild? Well, that would depend, Mike, on what kind of what are we talking about? Are we talking about, a you know, obviously we've been talking quite a bit about lakes so that the chances of that happening are going to be pretty slim. Um, when we talk about flowing waters, yes, there's opportunities to do that. I want to real quickly mention too, uh, there's a lot of discussion about natural reproduction and uh, some of these questions could be coming from a, a part of, you know, guys fish in other states and say like the Great Lakes, Wisconsin, play, Michigan, places like that. They do have some lakes there, but these are lakes that are 200,000 acres plus. So these are huge lakes and uh, I, I, they have some um, natural spawn in some of their lakes. So, but in Pennsylvania, you know, our largest lake is around, you know, just under about 13,000 acres, uh, you know, 13,000 13, acres or so. So, you know, it, you're kind of comparing apples to oranges when you're talking about a lake environment. When it comes to stream, when it comes to uh, river systems, though, um, you know, in our 2017 update, you know, part of that was we don't have a lot of information about our flowing waters. We stock them, we sample them, um, but not we weren't doing really any real targeted surveys for them. We did for bass, we did for other species, um, but that's the greatest place of having natural reproduction occurring. So part of that plan was to. And what we're doing now is evaluating that maybe we're going in there when we're not we don't we're not doing any stock is they're on an off year because everybody knows that it's an alternate year even years and odd years when we're doing our stockings um and when we're in there and it's not a stocking year we can be in there you know in august july and august and september when fish have an opportunity to naturally spawn in there we can look for those young of the year fish to determine what is the level of natural reproduction in those waters um, also, we'll come in in the spring and we'll take a look at what is the adult populations and support that. So, you know, if we if we had natural reproduction in all of our all of our flowing water systems, that would be great. And it was at a level that was, you know, of a high enough level that sustained a fishery and provide a high quality fishery. That would be tremendous. But again, over time here now, we we've, we've documented some that have some of them. Some waters have natural reproduction in them, but not at a level where they would not need to have stock anymore, but you know, continuing work is still being done with that. The person asking the question here was specifically referring to the Ohio River, just making the comment that he sees, um, tell me if he's right, but according to his records, there hasn't been any purebred musky stockings there since the early 2000s. However, he just wanted to comment that he still catches plenty of muskies in the Ohio River of sure. all sizes. Yeah, sure. And that's something we can follow up with this gentleman uh, with our biologist in our Ohio. Um, I kind of manage the uh, more on the Allegheny River, but that's something we can follow up with him. We'll get his contact information. Um, yeah, and I know that our our Somerset office um, biologists have been 
the, you know, part of we, we've been writing some make, making some recommendations in our sampling for each year we update and uh, places we want to. You know, put on our list of what we've been stocking before, maybe we've made a species change, you know, kind of evaluate those fisheries and the Ohio is definitely part of that analysis. So absolutely. Okay, um, Jared, let's talk about voluntary musky permits. It's a program that started a couple of years ago. Fish and Boat Commission made the voluntary musky permits available as, um, again, not a requirement to fish for muskies, but more or less a donation to help boost up the musky program. Those cost $10 a piece for an annual permit. You could buy them in uh, you know, multi-year quantities if you'd like to, too, if you really wanted to support the program. Sales of those have done pretty well. Uh, talking to you, you know, from, from your standpoint, someone who um, benefits uh, as, a, as a hatchery system, you'll see those dollars uh, come, to, come into the hatchery system. Let's just talk about the success of, of the voluntary musky permits and what successes you've seen as a result of that program? Yeah, sure. The, I think this is a real good feel good story. You know, I think the, the opportunity of the anglers to put some money into which programs they'd like to see their money go to and feel good about knowing that that money is directly helping the species they care for, um, I think is a great opportunity we're giving to the anglers of Pennsylvania, uh, specifically the muskie program. Um, this permit is sold, you know, Better than I expected, you know, I think the 1st year we raised about $16,000 and this. This last year, we raised, we doubled that we raised 32,000 dollars. It came from musky anglers or just anglers of Pennsylvania that were excited about that program and decided to. Give some of their hard earned dollars towards that program and you know, that's that means a lot. You know, it's that it means that we're doing something right that the anglers out there are care about what we're doing and. Uh, it makes us feel good. Just the popularity of the, the permit itself, you know, I, that means a lot. You know, then when you look at the, the money available, it, it's great. You know, we haven't had a, a license increase in a long time, so we've been on a pretty fixed budget. And uh, this extra money gives us a chance to do some things around the hatchery that are just just targeted at that musky program and helping that out. You know, the first year we were able to install a, a very large water heater. That'll give us the opportunity to heat to directly heat water just for the muskie program. Uh, in the past, when we were raising muskies and trying to go through that 45 day conversion period, water temperature is very key. But a lot of times we'd have some hiccups because other species we're raising at the time, or even the, the fact that we're heating the building at the time was drawing away from the heat, you know, being used to heat up that water. And it would, you know, detrimentally affect our program sometimes. So now we have that that water heater that's going to directly um, provide heated water to the muskie program, so that that will never happen again. You know, and I I believe this coming year we're going to add another water heater to that program, which will further solidify that. You know, we have some proposals in. I was hoping to hear something before now, but we have some proposals written for how to spend the thirty two thousand dollars for this year. Uh, I haven't gotten word back on that being approved yet, but um, when it happens, I'm sure we'll share it all over Facebook and uh, that'll be exciting as well. But the, the key is for the anglers to know that these programs are working how we thought they were going to work. You know, you, there was a lot of comments on social media sites early on. And the biggest thing people were worried about was just wondering if the money was going to go to where it was supposed to. And um, at this point, we can, you know, we can show and definitively say that w that money is going into dedicated accounts for these programs and is definitely getting used and is a huge benefit to these programs. So it's it's greatly appreciated. And Mike, a, a quick follow up with that with Jared as well, too. You know, we really want to take a look at this, these funds and also, you know, what are some great opportunities that we can provide for our anglers as far as musky fishing? So we're really trying to think maybe outside the box and you know, uh, look at some opportunities to really, um, you know, as well as handle the infrastructure things, making sure we're good there and, and you know, and making sure that we're providing the most healthiest and largest fish that we can uh, through our hatchery system, but also, you know, looking at an angler's perspective of maybe where, um, you know, what are some new things? What are some things that we can try? What are some things that will create a buzz, you know, create some really excitement for our anglers with that money? So. That's part of the uh, process where everybody has had an opportunity to kind of share that from hatcheries perspective and fisheries management perspective of, you know, 
what what would the anglers really like us to see do with that? And like, what what would be some direct? Whether that be habitat, you know, um, creating special lakes, things like that. That's some stuff that we're we're entertaining and and definitely want to take a look at. So. Well, you guys have been with us now for about 45, 50 minutes here, and uh, we're going to try to fill the hour, but we're going to just try to get to the last couple of questions that have come in on Facebook here before we wind things down. I want to thank you both for your time and taking out uh, a little bit of time here on a Friday to do this. I think um, those who are tuned in are, are appreciative to, to hear some some questions answered and uh, to learn you know, an update about this, this program. So th here, here's one. This is talks about how fish act basically after they're after they're stocked so um let's see here what are your thoughts on stocked muskies this is from donnie on facebook what are your thoughts on stocked muskies washing down river in flowing waters what about over dams is there any evidence that fish migrate up river through obstacles like locks and such Sure, I can field a little bit on this one, and maybe Jared can uh, uh, follow up behind me. But um, you know, we we uh, you know, oftentimes when we have releases in, in in some of these lakes, and I'll give you an example, like Woodcock Creek Lake, it has a drawdown, and it's a core impoundment. We stock it with muskies. I'm sure there, you know, we know that um, some of the fish are able to get around that dam because it it has muskies below that. Now we know also know that when there's a triggered release like that, um, you know, fish come up from say French Creek in that area, and they'll come up into the tailwaters as well, too. So, yeah, they're, you know, the dams, they aren't made to pass fish, but we know that Woodcock, we know that Allegheny Reservoir is another one at the tailwaters there. Um, we know through uh, actually other species that they, they're able to make it through there. Um, there's a paddlefish population in the reservoir, and we documented paddlefish below the reservoir. There's nowhere else in the in the river that far up that has paddlefish. And we know, uh, based on some tagging efforts that New York did, that those were New York fish. So we know that, you know, you know, we don't have a lot of fish ladders for fish to go up and around. So basically, if fish goes over that, they're going to be, you know, subject to being below that. Um, I know this is an issue in Ohio as well, too. They've had some escapement issues with some of their fish going through the dam. We we know that our fish can make that through that. And typically, a lot of these places, we are already stocking muskie below these in a poundment. So it's, um, you know, it, it happens. We have a situation in Conneaut Lake is one. Jared's well familiar with that one where, you know, fish can get around um, and they can make it, um, you know, and, and not see too much mortality with that. But, you know, the, those are some of the things that just happen in nature and happen by man-made impoundments such as that. And then Jared, here's a question regarding stocking someone. Uh, let's try to be more specific here. But John on Facebook uh, asking the question, when we stock muskies, do we also stock along with the muskies any bait fish for them to feed on? And that's probably a, it's, it's probably a two tiered answer to that one. So who wants to handle that one? It's yeah, I mean, um, the, the direct answer is no, that we don't do that. Um, however, that your question, that question is probably easier addressed by, um, how do we come to the conclusion of where we're going to stock muskies at, you know, our biologists are out assessing these waters all the time and they're requesting us to stock muskies in places where the forage fish are available already. Um, they're not going to ask us to put muskies someplace that the forage isn't available for these fish to succeed. So, um, that's part of the process that goes into the fisheries management decisions. And Brian, I'd follow up with you by saying that sometimes when we open a new, uh, you know, for instance, after a dam rehabilitation project, when a lake has been drawn down for several years and then it's refilled, could you talk about when muskies are included in a long-term restocking plan? Oftentimes you get the question, don't, you know, why are you putting the muskies in there? There's a misconception that they'll eat everything. Can you talk about, you know, how that, how that works and why the answer to that is probably no, they're not going to eat everything. <laughs> Sure. Great question. Uh, so when we have a reclaimed impoundment, and unfortunately, we've been ha they've been coming up too often. <laughs> but th those things are out of our control. We have some old and old aging, you know, impoundments that um, you know they no longer meet the DEP safety protocol for uh, continue operation of them. So uh, a lot of times these have a very good fishery in them, and then we have to kind of work on getting those fish out of there, put them in a safe place where they can go, and then. 
once they're you know, drawn down, then we we build a restocking plan. It's a three year, typically a three year restocking plan, and it's it's built similar to what species are already in the lake. Uh, what what was really working well. Uh, some of those waters, I'll give you an example. Tamarack Lake is one of them, located in Crawford County. Um, that's one that was a really good producer for muskies. Uh, we have intentions of us, um, you know, uh, restocking that back up in the lake with that to, uh, you know, provide that fishing experience for our anglers. It did very well. Um, so we usually uh, start with fingerlings is what we do. And uh, we have a very tiered approach of how we do that. Start with bass and pan uh, pass and, and some forage species. So they have a immediate food source. And then after about a couple years, Year or two, then what we'll do is we'll start introducing all the other species in there. And then as those populations begin to build and um, repopulate the lake, we'll come in and we'll do a survey and we'll assess those uh, lakes and see, make any adjustments to our stockings that we, we need to, numbers, or you know, if, if we need to tweak it a little bit. Um, and then at that point, um, using most of those waters are catch and release at that time. Uh, just to protect those populations. Now, musky are going to be stocked annually in walleye. So uh, that's something that we'll, we'll monitor through that to make sure they're meeting our management plan goals and, and, and uh, you know, get the lake back to where it was before. Gentlemen, I want to thank you again as we wind down here. There's a, a wealth of information in the last hour that I hope people have a chance to go back if they have any questions and tuned in late. They go back and watch from the beginning. I think you guys addressed quite a, quite a bit of stuff. As I'm looking at fishandboat.com right now under the state record fish page. It says that Lewis Walker Jr. of Meadville, Pennsylvania owns the state record for a muscalunge all the way back in 1924 out of Conneaut Lake, Crawford County. The fish weighed 54 pounds, three ounces. So 54 pounds, three ounces. And of course, we'll preface this by saying that Pennsylvania state record fish um, are based on weight, not length. So the idea that we are only including weight. So let's just look at that. That's a that's a hefty that's a monster. So <laughs> back in 1924, it, it stood for almost 100 years at this point. As we wrap up our our discussion here, guys, based on what we know about the muskie program, um, you know where the muskies are thriving right now. Brian, I'll start with you. If you had Absolutely. to do a if you had a prediction, where would you say the next state record muskie is going to be caught from out of Pennsylvania waters? Sure. I love this question. Uh, you know, anglers, we, we got a lot of interested anglers out there who just enjoy our fishery that we provide. And, you know, um, we've got, got, we got, we got all kinds of anglers out there. We guys that are just starting to fish um, and they're wanting where some great places to go fish and where they're at. And then uh, we have uh, folks out there that, um, you know, are diehard muskie fishermen and, uh, they probably have a better knowledge of these than myself, but we can kind of use some historical catch information where we think there might be some great places, uh, you know, some places where uh, uh, musky records could be broken. Um, I would, I would preface by saying it's probably going to happen in a larger lake or a larger flowing water system is what's going to happen. So I have a short list of about five waters where I feel that, uh, you know, it's our opinion, but also looking at some of our catch data, uh, the, you know, determine that. Um, uh, you know, kind of putting some logistics to this, but, um, so, um, 1st, one would be Pymatuming Lake. It's a 13,000 acre lake, a huge lake. And, um, you know, our guys have been sampling that and seeing some really nice size fit, not only numbers of fish, but nice size fish. It is very fertile water. It has a abundant forage base. And those are some key factors, um, you know, for getting fish to that size. You got to have the right growing conditions. You got to have the right. Uh, space for them, as Jared mentioned, that they're very uh, territorial with these fish. Um, and then, um, you know, it's got to have the right fertility of the water and all that. So that's definitely one of those. Uh, Allegheny Reservoir is another one. I don't know if our anglers are aware of this, but that's where the state record Northern Pike came from. It still holds value to there. Um, maybe some of you have heard or not, but the Kinzu Giant, that might ring a bell with some of our folks. Uh, that was actually a fish that was sampled by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. That fish was 54 pounds, 14 ounces, 54 and three quarter, three eighths inch size fish. Um, now that wasn't obviously fit, caught by uh, fishing line. It was sampled through our, uh, some biologists, but it has every opportunity uh, to see some really nice size fish in there. Uh, the third one would be Lake Arthur. Um, 
this one uh, is, uh, you know, our, our area 1 crew have been sampling this over years and, and getting some really nice and lots of nice lots of musky and really nice sized musky out of that. And then for a real quick flowing water system, um, you know, I think they are like any river, you know, it's. If you read any magazines, um, and, and these are the experts talking about this and ranking waters across the United States. Did you know that the Allegheny River is ranked 10th best out of all the destination places to go to fish for muskies? And uh, we, we've had a few here down in Tyanesta at the outlet where they've, they've, they've pushed 50 inches. So absolutely opportunities in the Allegheny River. Jared, any rebuttal to that or uh, agreement? I think you might be on mute, my friend. Yeah, I think you're on mute, mind. Jared. Well, re well, I'll re-ask the question, Jared. Brian I almost made it through. <laughs> where, where, do you think the next, where do you think the next state record muskie could be caught out of? My answer would definitely be the Ken Kinzu Reservoir. It's It's got the historic historical data to show that it produces big fish. You get the, the old wives' tales of divers going down and inspecting the dam and seeing, you know, fish that were bigger than them down there. Um, it's just it's big. it's a musky population that's on the comeback. You know, it's definitely we're definitely seeing a lot of young fish in there. Um, so I think, you know, 10 years from now, there could be a giant come out of there. All right, I'm going to get a dozen night crawlers and head on down there this evening. No, just kidding. Hey, hey, Mike, I had one just real, one quick follow up here about, our, you know, we're talking about a big game changer was for these yearling muskies that we're stocking. You know, and then we're very early in the initial stages of this. We really only started stocking those fish in 2018. Um, but just amongst biologist staff, at least, and talking to some of the anglers, we're really seeing some products of that right away. And it's not going to take very long to really see some fish, you know, be above that threshold where we're going to be moving into the 40s and 50s because we've really, you know, their size and that size is going to be higher in survival. Um, so they're going to contribute and get to the, you know, the size a lot quicker um, as well as too is, you know, just the waters that we're sampling. We're hearing great comments about that um, and seeing the dot, seeing the cases ourselves just through sampling efforts and waters where we, you know, it was, we started writing notes about the waters that we're in and seeing how well they're doing, seeing those numbers and those size ranges. And they were from a, a from that yearling product. All right, gentlemen, I want to thank our guests here today, Jared Sayers from the Lionsville Hatchery, Brian Ensign, fisheries biologist, and uh, guys, you just have been a wealth of information. Thanks for being so open and helping everybody out here today. Uh, for more information about Muscalines, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission's musky program, Pennsylvania's best musky fishing waters, some musky fishing tips. I was kidding about the night crawlers, by the way. <laughs> uh, head to fishandboat.com. All right, so um, final thoughts from you both. This is just a, a quick thing. People who want to start never musky fish before, where's a good resource to go to? Who should they talk to? And I'll just, I'll, we'll just, we'll just give that one to, to, to Jared. Yeah, I'm glad you touched on that, Mike, because I think it's something we always want to be cognizant of as we want to grow this sport. Um, we have... Uh, several musky clubs throughout the state of Pennsylvania. I would encourage anybody that's interested to look into those musky clubs. There's the uh, Three Rivers Musky Club, the Nittany Valley Musky Club, the Penn Jersey Musky Club, and the Susquehanna M Musky Club. You just Google those and you'll find some information on how to get in contact with them. They all have Facebook sites. Um, you can go to those, you can get to their meetings and ask them questions, and those guys will be more than willing to help you out and get you started. Um, but Perfect. my recommendation. Yeah, and check out our website. We've got, you know, we've got a musky website on there. It's got great resources on there. PF social media or channels, PFBC uh, um, um, YouTube pages and Facebook. There's lots of articles on there. We have biologist reports of these lakes where guys go to fish. Um, we we produce, provide that information to our anglers. You know, if they want to see what the latest catch information is there, if they want to make it worth their while to make a trip over there to do that. Um, you know, so yeah, feature articles in our Pennsylvania fish and boat and angler magazine. We, we cover muskies, Northern pike, all kinds of different species. So sure. All right. Great job guys. Thanks again. I want to thank you both for being part of the virtual session here this morning. Remember you can find answers to many of your frequently asked fishing and boating related questions, including all things musky over at fishandboat.com.
If you enjoyed this presentation on Facebook, YouTube, or wherever you found us today, please like it and share it. Help us spread the word about our virtual outdoor expo content. Our final session of the week will happen this afternoon at 1 o'clock, just about two hours from now, when we'll deliver our wrap-up show. And we'll uh, talk to Deputy Executive Director for Field Operations, Andy Shields, and maybe some other surprise guests. We're going to look back on the week's most interesting discussions, try to answer some of those lingering questions that we didn't get to throughout the week, and we'll preview another upcoming event in a virtual fashion. It's going to be called the Virtual Fishery Summit, and Brian will be part of that as well. So we'll have more about that coming up at 1 o'clock. Again, thanks to our guests, Jared, Brian. Have a great day. Have a great extended President's Day weekend, and we'll catch you guys another time. Take care, everyone. everyone. We'll see you on the water sometime. All right.